Good day, folks. Pastor Jim Thomas from the Village Chapel here in Nashville, Tennessee, with your daily devotion. We're going to spend a few days uh, with this book, which I've never used before in one of our videos here, one of our daily devotions. It is a really great book called Questions of Truth, 51 Responses to Questions About God, Science, and Belief. And I'm hoping this isn't too early in your day to be able to read some of this information. This is written by John Polkinghorne, and a uh, man I met, was fortunate enough to meet uh, some number of years ago, a good friend, some of you will know Steve Guthrie, is a professor at Belmont University, invited me to come to a luncheon where John Polkinghorne would be speaking. He came over from the UK. Um, he is a major figure in today's debates on science and religion, Polkinghorne is. He was president of Queen's College, Cambridge, founding president of the International Society for Science and Religion, and professor of mathematical physics at Cambridge University. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, the British Na National Academy of Science, is ordained also, though, in the Church of England, and he made uh, quite a stir in 1979 when he resigned his post as a uh, quantum physic uh, physics professor to enter uh, theological study and become a priest in the Anglican Church. So quite amazing, great combination uh, in his own mind, great combination of, of knowledge and wisdom and, and uh, uh, understanding for science and religion. So I'll begin in this first section, leading questions that are really about science and religion. Um, he, in sort of a uh, italic sort of, let me lay out, I'll show you how it works, but it's just like that, yeah. So in italics here will be the questions, and then he'll go on to just offer a short answer to those. So get your coffee and your bacon and your egg sandwich so you can uh, enjoy five or ten minutes of this, all right? How can there be any meaningful interplay between science and religion is the question that he was asked and is asked often. It is said the universe was written in the language of mathematics, yet the Bible is a mere collection of words. And so there you go. Um, you might think he's on his back foot, but he's not. He's John Polkinghorne, and uh, he has some great answers. Mathematics and words, he says, are both means for expressing concepts. One uses whatever is appropriate to what one wants to express. Darwin wrote The Origin of Species in words and without mathematics, because that was the way to get his profound evolutionary idea across. There's nothing mere about words. Think of Shakespeare and Tolstoy, Polkinghorne says. Science and religion are certainly concerned with different aspects of reality, so they express themselves differently. Science looks at the world impersonally, treating it as an it, you might say. This gives it the great secret weapon of experiment, the ability repeatedly to manipulate things to see what happens in principle and quite often in practice. If you do not believe what you are told happens, you can check it out for yourself. Consequently, science is often able to express its results in the impersonal language of mathematics. Once we look at reality from a pers personal perspective, however, the approach has to change. Strict repetition is no longer possible. We never hear a Beethoven quartet exactly the same way twice, even if we play the same disc again. Relationships can no longer be manipulative. If I am always setting traps to see if you are my friend, I shall soon destroy the possibility of friendship between us. I got to read that last sentence again. If I'm always setting traps to see if you are my friend, I shall soon destroy the possibility of friendship between us. That relationship has to be experienced through trusting, not testing. If this is true between human persons, it is scarcely surprising that it is also true of the relationship with a transpersonal reality, God. It's no use saying, if there is a God, let him write me a message in the clouds. God does not play that sort of silly game. Um, he goes on to say, one could summarize the difference between science and religion by saying that they are asking different questions about the nature of reality. Science is concerned with the question, how? By what process do things happen? Theology is concerned with the question, why? Is there a meaning and purpose behind 
what is happening. We are perfectly familiar with the fact that we can ask and answer both questions about the same event. The kettle is boiling because burning gas heats the water. The kettle is burning because I want to make a cup of tea. And will you have one too? <laughs> we do not have to choose between these two answers. And in fact, if we are fully to understand the event of the boiling kettle, we need them both. In an exactly similar way, we need the insights of both science and religion if we are fully to understand the rich reality that we inhabit. We have every reason to expect that science is able to answer its own questions without having to call on religion, and similarly, science cannot answer religion's questions for it. How and why, mechanism and meaning, are distinct inquiries. Nevertheless, this does not mean that the answers are completely disconnected. There must be a relation of consonance between them. If I were to say that I want to make a cup of tea and I have just put the kettle in the refrigerator, you would rightly be suspicious. There is therefore the possibility and need for a fruitful dialogue between science and religion as they compare their insights into reality. The rest of this book right here explores that interaction. If science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth, they are friends and not foes. Why then is there a common misperception of warfare between science and religion? It arises partly from mistakes made in the past. When Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859, many people, both religious and non-religious alike, opposed him because they thought that acknowledging human kinship with the animals would be fatal to human dignity and destructive of human morality. In our subsequent discussions of evolution, we shall seek to show that this was a wrong response. As a matter of historical fact, the mistaken character of this thinking was realized by many religious people at the time. The English clergyman, Charles Kingsley, and the American botanist, Asa Gray, were prominent among those who welcomed Darwin's insight from the start. Moreover, the illegitimate importation of non-scientific ideological influences into scientific evaluation has not been the preserve of believers alone. Fred Hoyle embraced the now discredited steady-state theory of cosmology precisely because he feared that what he contemptuously termed the Big Bang Theory would support the idea of the universe as a creation. And so you see people on both sides have made mistakes and people on both sides have been open to a welcome and of discussion. And Polkinghorn is really great. I hope that wet, uh, whets your appetite for a little bit of this and I'll uh, probably read a few more days from it um, in some of the other categories which are really fascinating. He does a treatment on human nature, a treatment on the concept and existence of God, the um, questions about how did the universe begin? Uh, is everything random or was there some design behind it all? I, this guy's fascinating. Uh, he talks about evolution. He talks about evil. He talks about the human person, about religion and what place do non-Christians have in God's universe? Just so much here. And uh, I think uh, it's a great, resource myself. I've been um, thoroughly inspired by John Polkinghorne. Let me get our day started with a prayer. Lord, you are amazing. You are good. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, but uh, even before that, for wiring us to be curious about you and about the question, why? Thank you for the question, how? But really, thank you for the question, why? I pray, Lord, that as we uh, pursue the question, how, and the other questions that we ask, uh, that we will be drawn by the question, why, and who, and that we'll be drawn to you. Um, you who created us, you who we are longing to know. So deep down in our souls, Reveal yourself to us, I pray this day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Daily Devotions with Pastor Jim Thomas is a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. If you find this daily devotional beneficial, leave a review and share it with friends and family. 
For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com. Artwork for this podcast by Kim Thomas. Music by Phil Kagey.